The battles of World War II weren't fought here in the United States, but that doesn't mean the war didn't have a huge impact here at home. That's what we're going to talk about today on Mr. E's Classroom. Hey ladies and gentlemen, Mr. E here. Today's video is called The Home Front. Specifically, we're going to look at the question, how did the war affect Americans at home? And when we say war, we're talking World War II. So grab your pencil and paper, get ready to take some notes. Hopefully by the end of the video, you'll have a good answer for the question. So the Japanese just attacked Pearl Harbor. 2,500 Americans are dead. The government has declared war on Japan and Germany and Italy have declared war on the United States. What do we do now? The first answer is we need to mobilize the military. Immediately after Pearl Harbor, 60,000 men volunteered for military service to basically avenge what happened to us. Over the course of the entire war, almost 16 million people would serve in the military. Remember, the war is going to be on two fronts. We need to fight back against Japan but we also need to go over to Europe and fight Germany and Italy. And when I say 16 million people serve, the people that served in World War II pretty much stretched the entire gambit. All sorts of minorities joined up the military. Almost a million African Americans joined up over the course of the war. Roughly 300,000 Mexican Americans, 50,000 Asian Americans, about 25,000 Native Americans. And on top of that, this was the first war in which women were allowed to serve in, in the military. Now, they were relegated to non-combat roles, but almost 350,000 women served as nurses, clerks, radio operators, transport pilots, things like that. And with so many people joining up the military, the military flat out just needs stuff. Luckily, there was the War Production Board. Just like during the Great War, the government kind of got involved and got companies to make what was needed. The War Production Board basically got non-war related industries to start making things for the war. And when I say making things, I mean they made everything. Everybody got involved. This was phenomenal for our economy. This is the thing that actually brought us out of the Great Depression. When the War Industries Board fired up and got businesses to make everything war-related, jobs were everywhere. America was pretty much at full unemployment. Cities that had some sort of defense industries saw massive population explosions, and in some instances, pretty much overnight. This war basically ended the Great Depression. To give you a general idea of how much stuff America produced over the roughly five years of the war, America produced 70,000 ships, 185,000 airplanes. To keep that in perspective, that's more airplanes produced just by the United States than all of the Axis powers combined during the war. We made roughly 120,000 tanks and millions upon millions of guns, not to mention plenty of bullets to feed those guns. Something relatively new that happened during the Second World War that we hadn't seen before in America was the amount of women entering the workforce. Roughly about 6 million women entered the workforce for the first time. They were basically taking the place of men who were off serving in the military. Approximately 35% of the total workforce during this war was made up entirely of women. There is one interesting issue that arises when this happens is that child care became a big issue. What did mom do with the kids while she was at work? Have you ever put a lot of thought into why school happens when it does? A lot of it goes back to the fact that women had to work during this war and school was a great way to keep the kids while she was at work. Unfortunately, at the beginning of the war, it took a little convincing to get women involved in the workforce. The government put out an ad campaign called Rosie the Riveter. I'm sure we're all familiar with Rosie. She's the lady that says, we can do it. This campaign encouraged women to take even the heavy industry jobs, working in the factories, doing the riveting, doing the welding, stuff like that. 
Another extremely important government office that pops up during this war is the Office of Price Administration. With so much stuff being produced for the war effort, people at home basically kind of had to do without. This led to some pretty sticky situations. People that had excess could more or less charge whatever they wanted for those goods. This is where the Office of Price Administration steps in. Their job was to basically control the price of consumer goods to prevent inflation or price gouging, stuff like that. They also instituted a rationing system. Anything that was deemed essential for military, things like rubber, gas, cloth, that kind of stuff that troops could use was rationed to the general public. Everybody got fixed allotments and they were allowed just enough to get by, but nothing excessive because it needed to be used for the war. This was done through coupon books, or sometimes there were small little tokens used. If you wanted to purchase a rationed item, you also had to present what was called a ration stamp or a ration token. As long as you had the stamp or the token, you could purchase that item. Without the stamp or the token, the clerk at the store wasn't allowed to sell it to you. To kind of get around, especially some of the food rationing that was going on, there was also a huge push for this thing called Victory Gardens. All over the United States, anywhere that you could plant a vegetable or a fruit, people started doing this. It was a way to give more food to the troops. That food that was produced on large-scale agricultural farms was shipped straight to the troops. Most families did the best they could to raise their own food. Another big issue was trying to figure out a way to pay for this war. War is incredibly expensive. And here in the United States, our economy went from being absolutely nothing to being booming more or less overnight. Unfortunately, the government had spent a lot of its money trying to fix the economy. In order for this war to work, citizens would have to finance it. This isn't anything that's new. The same thing happened during the Great War. It's just the massive scale with which things like war bonds were sold during this war. People were encouraged pretty much to use just about any extra money they earned to buy a war bond. To understand how a war bond works, it's, it's actually pretty simple. You give money to the government now, and down the road a few years after the war has been won, they slowly give you that money back. Here at home, with the economy basically fixed and industries going like crazy, some bad habits started to come back, creep back in. During the war, the United States had to deal with some discrimination issues. There was a campaign called the Double V Campaign that was started by African Americans. Their slogan was Victory Against Fascism Abroad and Discrimination at Home. This was a campaign led by a guy named A. Philip Randolph. The idea was, if we're trying to fix major social problems in Europe, why can't we fix basic social problems here in the United States? We also saw the, a group called CORE, or the Congress of Racial Equality, kind of pop up. They led a lot of nonviolent protests against things like urban segregation. These big cities where war industry jobs were kind of booming found themselves segregated really quickly throughout the city, and it just didn't work very well. It made it hard for certain groups of people to get to work and do their job like they needed to. CORE stepped in and tried nonviolent approaches to integrate cities. FDR also passed Executive Order 8802. Basically, this order was all about fair hiring practices. FDR knew that unless the government stepped in, businesses that were doing work for the government or being paid by the government would probably have some pretty discriminatory hiring practices. Executive Order 8802 basically said if you're getting money from the government, you have to be fair when you hire people. In some ways, this idea of discrimination during World War II kind of gets a little bit swept under the rug, but you could start to see slowly pieces of the civil rights movement put together and build. A great example of this is this political cartoon right here was actually drawn by a well-known artist, a guy named Dr. Seuss. In this picture, we have Uncle Sam talking to the piano player who happens to be the war industry. And Uncle Sam is 
encouraging the guy to be sure that he's using all the keys on the piano because that's where the most harmony is going to be. With so many men off in Europe and the Pacific fighting these wars, another major issue faced here at home simply dealt with agriculture. There just weren't enough people to work all the big farms. This is where the Braserio program comes into play. During the war, America actually partnered with Mexico and brought laborers to the United States for the purpose of running the farms or working the farms so that we could make sure there was enough food to be sent over to American troops. And lastly, probably one of the not so shiny moments in American history dealt with Japanese internment, specifically a thing called Executive Order 9066. After the bombing of Pearl Harbor, a lot of Americans were incredibly fearful of Americans of Japanese descent. They could be spies. I mean, the way that Pearl Harbor was attacked was pretty sneaky. The way the government decided to deal with this was by basically putting Japanese American citizens in what we called internment camps for their own protection and security. The way we went about doing this was not the best in the world. In most cases, these people, typically uh, Japanese Americans living on the West Coast, were given 48 hours to essentially liquidate or sell everything they owned or it would be forfeit to the government. Then they were forced to report to internment camps. As you can expect, a lot of these Japanese American citizens, citizens of the United States, thought this idea of internment was an incredible violation of their civil rights. Eventually a court case got put together and taken all the way to the United States Supreme Court. This happens in 1944 in Korematsu versus the United States. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court upheld the legality of using these internment camps. The Supreme Court basically said that wartime security overruled civil rights. Fortunately, the United States did eventually see the error of their ways, and the government officially apologized for what they did to the Japanese Americans that were interred in 1988. And kind of as a we're sorry we threw you in prison for no reason, they offered any living internees a $20,000 kind of apology payment. With 100,000 Japanese Americans basically thrown in prison during the war, you would think that a lot of Japanese Americans would be kind of against the United States. I want to really quick point out the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. There were a lot of Japanese Americans that were very patriotic and wanted to serve their country, even though their country was basically treating them like enemies. A lot of these Japanese Americans that volunteered were put in the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, also known as the Purple Heart Battalion. This group, entirely a volunteer unit, was sent over to Europe to fight. While they were there, they became the most decorated battalion in the European theater. Here's a quick rundown of some of their decorations, the medals they got. 21 Medals of Honor, the highest award you can get in the United States military. 52 Distinguished Service Crosses, that's basically one notch down from the Medal of Honor. 560 Silver Stars. To get a Silver Star, you have to do something pretty brave in combat. On top of that, there are also 28 oak leaf clusters given. You get an oak leaf cluster if you've already gotten a silver star. So these are people that have gone above and beyond multiple times. And lastly, this is where the Purple Heart Battalion gets their nickname. Through the course of the war, they received 9,486 Purple Hearts. To get a Purple Heart in the U.S. military, especially back then, you had to be wounded in combat. You had to get hurt, shot, stabbed, while you were fighting for your country. There were 9,000 Purple Hearts issued to this group of people that, had they stayed at home, would have wound up in a prison camp for no good reason. That's a patriotic person, in my opinion. Okay, so what do we need to take away from today's video? Number one, remember that when the U.S. mobilized for this war, 
they really mobilized and got the war machine running. Number two, remember that the war brought up some serious issues here in the United States that had to be dealt with. Number three, don't forget about the Japanese internment. Was infringing on civil rights to try to win the war a good thing? There you go, guys. The home front. Hopefully you got good notes. Hopefully you're ready for the quiz when it happens in class. And as always, till next time, remember, don't stop learning.